Well, I always said he was Daniel Boone. I'll never forget when he got a new quad and Mary came in and said, Robert wants to go quad riding with you. Finally, I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go up there. I followed him, we went up, and then he showed me where he killed the coyote, and he showed me where he can find other animals, and he showed me a commune to where people can come and they can hide in there and you can't find them. And then I said, hey, Robert, that was pretty fun. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. And he says, no, we probably won't. I don't think I'll be doing this anymore. And then, two weeks later, everything happened. Mexico, Canada, the UK, Brooklyn, New York. His dad is in Florida. You know, he had a California connection with the US Navy, New Mexico, Colorado, Virginia. From Florida, Texas, up into the Northeast, into Washington. I remember Guatemala. We've received some things from Europe, Scottsdale in the Phoenix area, from Payson and Sholo. I've been working on the Robert Fisher case for years now. There's no investigation that's captured my interest and passion quite like this case. It's left the world with a lot of questions. Piecing together everything, I had to start from the beginning, 21 years ago, with Robert and his wife Mary and their two children. There's big sister, 12-year-old Brittany, and her little brother, 10-year-old Bobby. And all of the Fishers had a relationship with Herb Greenbeck, and his wife, Lori. When uh, our company started growing, uh, Lori needed uh, another employee, so the kids all played together. And so our girls were great friends, saw each other every day. After probably a year or so, uh, we ended up getting an office across the street, so Mary came, she was kind of our office manager with Lori. The Fishers and the Greenbacks were close, no doubt. Both Herb and Lori said Mary was very friendly and prompt, organized. They loved having her work with them. So it was weird when on April 10th, 2001, they hadn't seen Mary yet. And that's when Herb gets a strange call. She didn't show up for work. It was about 8.20, 8.30. Doug said, uh, Herb, her house is on fire and there's accelerants. And that's kind of how the whole story started. We went over there as fast as we could, and the yellow tape was up. We just ducked in and went down to right to, at the end of the cul-de-sac, and then we could hear, you know, they found one body, they found another body. We didn't understand why Robert's truck was still there and Mary's truck was, you know, we just couldn't put it all together. So you're standing there in the cul-de-sac, the house is destroyed, and you're hearing there's bodies inside. Where's Robert? Did you think he was in there? Yes, I thought the whole family was. Everyone's looking at the Fisher family home thinking the same thing. What on earth happened here? That's when Scottsdale Police Detective T.J. Duran and another detective go inside the house to look at what was left. And John and I immediately kind of looked at each other and were like, I think we have a homicide here. Hugh Lockerbie, and I'm a lieutenant uh, with Scottsdale Police. My name is John Heinzelman, and I'm a homicide detective with Scottsdale Police Department. This entire case revolves around three detectives. T.J. Duran, who is now retired, Hugh Lockerbie, who used to be the lead detective on the case, and John Heinzelman, who is the current lead detective on it. All of their stories about this case intersect. At the beginning of the investigation, TJ gets a tip that neighbors heard Robert and Mary arguing the night before the explosion. I was a patrol officer in 2001. My beat, my assigned area was the home where the Fisher family lived. If a neighbor would have just called us to said, hey, there's a fight going on between Mary and Robert, I mean, I would have been responding to that. There was no call for a fight, so was there even an argument at all? There are three bodies found inside the house. Robert's truck is in the driveway. Mary's car is missing. It was a gruesome discovery. Two of those bodies are the young Fisher kids, Brittany and Bobby. Robert didn't show up for work. He worked at Mayo Clinic. Mary didn't show up for work. So who was the third body, Robert or Mary? They think Robert did this. And to my husband and I, we're like, there is no way. Detectives started to find odd things inside the home. This wasn't a normal house fire at all. In the search warrant, they say they found a firecracker in the home and a battery attached to a wire and foil paper, possible ignition devices. There was a natural gas line that was disconnected and it was just 
the matter of time before the amount of natural gas filled up the house to where it hit the flame and uh, it was enough to combust the house. Mary Fisher, she was the third body. All three of them, Mary and the kids, were found dead in their beds inside the home. It didn't make sense. Why wouldn't they have at least tried to run and escape the flames? They couldn't. They weren't alive when the house erupted into flames. He slit their throats while they were sleeping in bed. He slit his wife's throat, and then the FU shot was the bullet in the head. And that was a, a, a show of a crime. I mean, massive explosion. That wasn't a quiet crime. Yeah, everything behind it, the rigging of the, the gas lines, the, the pouring of the accelerants, the brutality of the murders, the charred remains of the bodies. I mean, just, you know, things that you would just, you cannot unsee, but you also have a hard time wrapping your head around, like what human would do something like this? He thought that the house was gonna burn to a point that no one would be able to recognize anyone and maybe he would just be lumped into the, the, the remains and therefore he's no longer on the run. He'd been planning this for a while. So you don't think he snapped? No, not at all. He planned this. Before the Fisher home explosion, detectives discover Robert makes a stop at an ATM down the street the night before, seen in these surveillance camera photos. That happens at 10.30ish at night, withdrawing $260, $280. Max is out what he can take out at the time. The pictures from the ATM and his, and his bank activity that came in afterwards, so to show that we didn't, that he so didn't those were, have any further. Are those his last transactions? Mm -hmm. Do you know where they were? I do, because we've had them all, we've had them all looked at, and some of them are checks that were cleared. You know, I was going to so say, so, so these two, after yeah. the 280, are those things that he he that deposited just, or uh, that, that just cleared went afterward. through? That withdrawal is still the last bank activity on his account. Why 280? Why did you go to the ATM that night? And and why haven't you taken any money out ever since? Those ATM pictures reveal something else, though. Robert is shown walking back to the car, but that's not his car. That's Mary's forerunner, the car missing from the Fisher home, the crime scene. Robert's now on the run. I called the guy and said, I know where he is. Go up to Young, Young Road all the way up to go to your left, start veering, you're gonna find him. I guarantee he's up there. And you told this to who? One of the Scottsdale policemen, you know, because he gave me his car. Call me if you, have, if you think of anything. And you called them the night of the fire. Oh my fire. goodness, yeah. I left the game and went out to where I could talk on my phone and I called them. And they didn't end up finding the car until 10 days later. They're probably going on leads. Can't go everywhere, everybody tells you. Do you wish they had followed up on your lead sooner? Oh, absolutely. I think every minute counted at that point. Fisher's Toyota 4Runner, which was first spotted here Friday in the woods near Young, may have been here for as long as a week. Yesterday, Fisher's dog, Blue, was still seen guarding the vehicle, but Fisher himself was gone. This is a massive manhunt. We're talking agencies from all over the state looking for Robert Fisher. The thought was, if his dog was found alive and his car was still there, then he couldn't be far. But Robert was too smart and too calculated for that. Gila County Sheriff's deputies ended the search where they started it. At the mouth of a cave, Fisher was suspected of using for cover. No one actually saw him up there or actually put eyes on him. So I guess we have to go back to when we saw him at the ATM. For tangible evidence, we have the house, we have the ATM, we have the forerunner. That's and that's it. it. And that's it. It's tough to make a puzzle with three pieces. Robert had seemingly eluded the police. They were back to square one. Like this was a tip of somebody that was seen up near the up near Roosevelt. This cabin is located up in the woods near Young, and um, they thought maybe that Robert Fish was living there. What was only a statewide investigation so far was about to go global and fast. We've gotten a ton of tips over the years that I saw him in Mexico, I saw him in Guatemala, I was on a trip, I saw him in a marketplace. A tip that investigators believe breaks the case wide open is nowhere near Arizona. I mean, my heart was like, oh my God, this is this this could really be him. We've got to we got to find this person like ASAP. I say, 
Oh, it looks just like him. Doesn't it? Oh my God. Oh my God. And I thought, I think we finally got him. Here's our chickens, Robert Major's chicken coop. Nice to Let me see you ride it. It's hard to go by the fences. Don't be acting cocky, Rinna. Watch the road. Maybe Robert should have watched this before he did it. Maybe he went down. Yeah, What's it like to see him on camera now? It's the same. Oh, just what a shame that somebody would have to, could go through to do this. I mean, what, what would drive him to do something like this? It's terrible. The Fisher home videos look like your typical 80s and 90s family home videos on the surface. But watching certain scenes with Herb unraveled a lot more about Robert. Up, up, up. Look how he's sitting there with his arms crossed, see? That body language. What do you think it says? I'm the man. I'm controlling. This is me. He's the only one talking. Ain't nobody else talking. I, I guarantee you, if you go through all their videos, it's Robert, the kids, the dog, like you said, and it's the yard, it's hunting, and it's that kind of stuff. What do you feel like it's missing? Mary. Yeah, obviously, the focus was on the kids, not the, not the marriage. Not many pictures here of him and her. I think this was Robert's life, not Mary's life. Herb was in an interesting position with Robert and Mary before the murders and house explosion. On one hand, he had just gone camping and hunting with Robert, but on the other hand, Mary worked for Herb and his wife, Lori. They were fond of Mary and they knew her really well. I think what Mary was trying to do was become a little more independent and I think that maybe was that was a threat to him her you independence think that he wanted full control yeah I knew one time that when Mary was at work Robert called her because he left he left for the weekend to go up north and he called her to go up north and she wanted to have someone go with her because she was afraid that he would do something to her uh, so that's what she told Lori that's the first time we've ever heard someone with a concrete example that prior to the murders and explosion, Mary was afraid Robert could hurt her. So one time we had a party at the house and Robert and Mary came over. And my brother-in-law was there who's a hunter and Robert said he had some great big hunt uh, uh, that he got, a deer that he got or an elk, and he wanted to show them. So they all went over to the house. It was like right around the block. And he showed him all these pictures of elk. It was one of the biggest elk on the wall anybody's ever seen. And then he went through all the pictures. And all the pictures were blood, were blood, were slicing, cutting, removing, smiling, holding a knife of blood. So they came back and said, that's something wrong with that guy. He took more pictures of the ritual of, of gutting the animal than the animal itself. He was a family man, um, a good father, a good husband, went to church to a certain group of people, and then on the other side, no, he was, he was a person who, um, who didn't have a happy marriage, who didn't have a happy childhood himself, and um, all he wanted to do was escape. We saw her as a bright and shining star among her peers, such a beautiful young lady, so precious, so unique, so special. I love you, Miria. I love you, Brittany. I love you. Mary's father was still giving Robert the benefit of the doubt, even at the funeral, telling the media this. He was the greatest dad. He was the greatest husband. I miss him. I miss him terribly. I miss him almost as much as I miss my daughter, because they were one. And we loved her and the kids. Crazy. After all this time, out still, yeah, painful. The funeral service for Mary and the kids, and the 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 um, memoriam page that we have here. So, and this, and everybody, and Pastor Greg, the the family friend who 
who, was, who gave us thoughts about the, the case. Inside John Heinzelman's office were boxes and boxes of Fisher case files and all the tips they've gotten in over the years. This was a tip of somebody that was seen up near the, up near Roosevelt. Yeah, I've never seen that before. This is what came of that one and it was proven not to be him. This again was a tip that we got that this cabin is located up in the woods near Young. How did you rule this out, that he wasn't there? What we could do at, this, at that point is to say we had no evidence that he was. So you don't actually know? Not necessarily, no. He could have been there? Sure, absolutely. Because he was in the Army, we do have the, his, his 10 print fingerprint cards and his signature on that, which we're able then to use if we find anything. If you look at and you can see the spots, like here's this middle of this of this delta. This becomes the, the critical piece to find Robert is that he does have his fingerprints. There are two tips in this file that are still very much a mystery to detectives. Here's the target picture that we were talking about, like him walking oh, yeah, through so. the door. There was a man that went in the target that matched a description of Robert Fisher. And they went to the store and they got the videotape. And then here's the still images of that person in January of 2002 walking through the door. So and yeah, that's, that's all we had. This next one was from South America. I remember a tip from 2009 and it was tourists that were at um, on vacation and they were at a convenience store, a little drugstore, bodega, and were taking photographs. And in the background of this picture is uh, a white male that looks, that looks like Robert Fisher. And that person came up and confronted them and said, give me that camera, don't you take my picture. And that raised some suspicion. Again, they didn't realize why until they got home and started doing a little bit more research and then said that that might be Robert Fisher. I think these I eyes the look different they, though. They look like him. I think those eyes look different. I don't know. Yeah. Here's the other one. Look at the other the other angle here. Yeah, you see with that hat. See, I say it does look like You think hat. so? Now Yeah, it's the nose and the mouth. Do you consider Robert Fisher a serial killer? Um, I wouldn't say serial killer. What I would say is the, the technical term that we use is that family annihilator. He's a mass murderer. A couple weeks after we interviewed John Heinzelman, he invited us back to his office to see the crime scene photos. I didn't really know what to expect seeing them. It's not access we normally get. It definitely made everything about this case much more personal to me. We got just scene photos. And this is from the fire department? Yeah, so we can, we can do printed scene photos and then we can go into some of the specifics. This is a bedroom here, so it's not as obvious right from here, but there's a body in there. Were they killed and placed in a fire or were they put in there and then the fire was started afterward? In all three, in Mary, Bobby, and Brittany, none of them had any soot in their lungs, none of them had any, any evidence that they were, that they were inhaling during the fire. A forensic anthropologist did bone impressions on the bodies to see how far the cuts to their throats went. There you kind of get an idea of, of where this must have been and how, how this person was positioned in order to create that sort of damage. They were cut from the front of their throats all the way into their vertebrae, practically decapitated. This is literally just that spinal column that's on the back. So you're already having to cut through several inches of someone's throat to get to this point. John first showed me pictures of Mary, or at least that's who we thought we were looking at. Oh, God. What do you think of looking at those really graphic pictures? I, I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's hard to look at. All that we've seen at this point was Mary alive, right? And then to see that, it's just like a completely shocking difference. The bodies were burned so badly, we realized things were mislabeled, and that wasn't Mary. That was actually Brittany. Yeah, I'm gonna say that that was Brittany that came in first. We think that was first. Brittany now. 
The giveaway was looking at x-ray photos of Mary's skull in a different file that showed the bullet. I see pieces. I see pieces. It's, it was like, that's, a... that's fragment from the bullet. Seeing Bobby was probably the hardest part for me. Will it be very obvious, Bobby's body compared to the other two? Yes. Of the three, he was the least damaged by fire. You can see how this is all still, all this is intact. All of his chest, all of his arm, his forearms were. You could tell he was probably lying on his cheek on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was protected from the fire, literally by his body. I think also too, what makes this really hard to see is that everybody, including myself, is used to seeing that that family portrait. That that's mm -hmm. our our greatest knowledge of Brittany and Bobby what they look like is from that portrait. Right. And you can't even tell they look like that here. I'm gonna ask you a hard question, man. Were there any mistakes made? Um, there were challenges in the case, um, challenges from the beginning where looking at it and reinvestigating this case, if it happened today, um, 21 years after it originally happened, I think things would have been different. We would have collected things, um, we would have collected more evidence, we would have been able to uh, preserve more things for more, uh, more forensic testing. I wouldn't go so far as to say there were mistakes made. There were limitations um, at the time, and uh, I think it was an overwhelming thing to walk in and find three bodies in a house fire. Detectives had no concrete leads yet of where Robert Fisher could be other than where his car was found. Once you pulled up here, I was like, holy I was here, uh -huh. you know, 20 years ago. But there were hundreds of places in that area where he could hide and be off the grid completely unseen. Is it plausible Robert Fisher could have survived in this cave? For more than a week, easy. Underground in miles and miles of caves. So your theory is he could have sat in there for a few yes. days, wait till everybody leaves the forest, right. and then gets out and leaves. Right. So Juan, how do you feel about spelunking for the first time? I'm nervous, but I think we'll be fine. I'll be able to fit because it's a small crack, so I'll be able to go <laughs> in and out. And... How do you feel about it? I'm not nervous at all. I love the fact that we're actually going to go into these caves that are kind of related to this case and can actually see what's there ourselves. So I'm not going to lie, I'm a little nervous about the spelunking. Squeezing into those little tight areas for a larger guy like me is a little it's definitely giving me pause that I might get stuck. <laughs> I don't want to look like Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> the three of us headed up Highway 87 toward Payson to meet up with a big group. We were going back to where Robert's car was found and Ray Keeler was bringing his permit so we could search the reservation land for the first time. Hi, you must be Shannon. Shanna and Jaren were two spelunkers I met through a Facebook group who would be with us for extra safety inside the cave called 41 Club. This is TJ. TJ Jaren was the former homicide detective on the case. This would be the first time he'd be back where his investigation took him over 20 years ago. The uh, plan for today is to drive from here in Payson up to the top of the rim to the Young Road, south about 10 miles, and stop where the, the vehicle was found. So you recognize all of that, right? Yes, I recognize this, this whole area. At first, it was weird. When we first turned off Young Road and came up here, I actually thought you were going too far. But that's because everything here looks... It all looks similar. Yeah, but once you pulled up here, I was like, holy I was here, you know, 20 years ago. All right, TJ, obviously there's some things that are going through your mind right now. You want to get over here first, why? Yeah, it just brings back a lot of memories. A lot of work. Wow, geez. It looks like yesterday when we were up here. Everything just fell into line looking for this man, and unfortunately we didn't find him. 
parts of TJ's investigation and Ray's search efforts overlapped back in 2001 after the car was found. When I got back Monday, a couple called me. They're driving down the young road, and this woman is telling me over the telephone there was a man walking up the road, and I believe he was on the outer edge. So when they drive, he's right here. She's the passenger. Uh huh. And she told me, she says, I'm telling you that was Robert Fisher. How many days between was that? Either the day of the truck being found or the day before the truck being found. If he was in the area, he had a room that was un looked at. So your theory is he could have sat in there for a few yes. days, wait till everybody leaves the forest, right. and then gets out and leaves. Right. I mean, there's several places he could have walked from here. Right. Oh, yeah. That lead to X, Y, and Z. That's well, why I never not... believed he came up here and killed himself, because this woman was adamant. She says, I believe that was Robert Fisher. Let's talk about the big Mexico tip that yeah. you remember. There was this tip that came in to me uh, regarding Fisher was in Mexico in this small fishing village, Progreso, Mexico. It was a picture of this individual uh, with different people that took pictures with him because they just met this guy. I mean, it was um, as close to a lookalike that I've seen. I mean, my heart was like, oh my God, this is, this, this could really be him. Oh, it looks just like him. Doesn't it? Oh my God. Sergio, look at these. It looks just wow. like him. That does look just like him. Look at that. When we went down to the dimples. Yes. To the forehead. Um, and I know it's hard because he has the visor and the yeah. sunglasses on, but. It just feeds into this mystic. So I just want to show you and see what you think. So one of the tips that came in was this man who was posing with people in Mexico. Oh my God. But man, that face, you gotta be kidding me. We figured out who these people were that produced a tip. They sent an agent out and they figured out who this guy was. It wasn't Fisher. So they're ruling out international tips, which are still coming into the Scottsdale Police Department even today in 2022. But most of the credible tips we were getting kept leading us to this same area around Young. And through my research, I came across the name of a couple I knew absolutely nothing about, nor how they were even involved in the Robert Fisher investigation, Jesse and David Klingbeal, who run a place called the Rockin' X Ranch. <laughs> Sergio and I hit the road again. We are in the middle of the Sierra Ancho Wilderness. And we began our own company. We do guided rock climbing and canyoneering and also offer river rafting tours. Out here, you can expect almost any type of predator. There's mountain lions, bears, bobcats. I am more afraid of running into Robert Fisher or somebody like that than I am a mountain lion. How did you? become a part of the story. When I went to visit a friend of mine that was working at the Cherry Creek store, cute, quaint little store. We went to check it out ourselves. You can't miss the sign off the side of the road. It's very unassuming. The clerk was really sweet and knew of the case, but didn't want to be on camera. Jesse's experience inside happened in 2007 or 2008. A little old man came in, he wasn't much taller than me, and uh, he was hauling an oxygen tank, and he had a really young ranch hand kid with him. They walked around and did their shopping, and then they came up to pay, and right on the counter, right in front, was the Robert Fisher flyer, the one with the three photos. The wanted poster? Yeah, so he looked at that, and he immediately just started tapping at it, and he started asking, why do you have my friend's picture? Why is he here? What did he do? He didn't do anything. What, why is he here? So my friend would just start asking him questions. You know, you know this person? Well, this person's wanted for really, really bad things. You know, um, where can we find your friend? And started saying his friend never did any of these things that they're saying. And he's, he lives with him and he loves him. And he's like his boy. Then he told the kid, get me out of here. Let's go, let's go. He didn't say what ranch. He just said a ranch. Yeah, he said a ranch. Did that make you believe him more or? Less? Oh, absolutely. Do you remember what they were driving? It was a beat up old Ford truck with a rack on the back, just like a dime a dozen out here. <laughs> Jesse gave an interview to the FBI after this happened with those exact details. 
To this day, there's been no confirmation of who that man in the store was or the man supposedly living on his ranch. How many ranches are around the young area? There's a lot. A lot. Is it possible he could be on a ranch and the sure. detectives never get to it? Sure. It's so wide open, so wild west. Sure, anything could happen, especially if he had a plan. At every turn in our investigation, it felt like it pointed to Robert Fisher being somewhere near Young. That theory was shaken up in 2004. The Canada tip is the one that so many people still have questions about. We got a tip from Vancouver area, and they, there was someone in custody, and local authorities thought this person is Robert Fisher. This is more for TJ. Okay, I'm gonna say. There, I'm quiet. Really? I'm really? Quiet. really? <laughs> These are all the people that have been in the cave since 2000. Because he was in the army, we do have his 10 print fingerprint cards and his signature on that. Showing me the signature just now is the first time I've actually seen his writing that is verified to be his. So we're looking if any of these match this. You stop effing people, F you, you get the trend. Robert Fisher. Just for clarification, that was written before the incident. This was found on July 4th weekend. So we don't know when that was written. Right, right. There's no date it was on that. July 4th of 2000. Okay. 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 So are there any swirlies? Because he does that on the W and the F. TJ, what are your thoughts looking at the two signatures? I personally, I don't believe it's him. And if you look at your signature again, yeah. Look at his name, most of it's slanted to the right, correct? Yeah. Yep, slanted to the right. Especially the L's of William. Right. Here, whoever wrote this is basically almost straight up. So those definitely do not match his signature. We were about to head into the 41 Club Cave. Because it's preserved for conservation, the exact entrance location isn't known to the public. The thing is, once you head into the cave, you drop off the map. Tell me, Wimby. That's good. Okay. Right here? You got me one? Go. You want to start recording on Brianna? So this is 41 Club. You're passing by the door right between us. Oh, wow. There was an actual door. Correct. Ray, how much cooler are the caves in the summer than outside? Up here at elevation, it's about 50 to 52 degrees. It's nice. So it doesn't change temperatures no matter the season? Correct. The first part of the crawling began, but once you got over a mound, the cave opened up. Is it plausible Robert Fisher could have survived in this cave? For more than a week, easy. We kept going further in. Juan, how you doing back there? Good. Jaren, will you give him a hand? I don't want him to slip. With Jaren and Shanna taking the lead. If I had all the time in the world to sit down here, then I'd just start a fire and boil the water. So, fire. That's a key component. If you can go out and hunt. If you can go out and hunt, then you can generally make fire. And you could have a fire down here and it wouldn't cause any carbon dioxide. Not with all the openings, there's enough airflow right. through here. Very people outside of it may not even know that you have a fire in here. We huddled up as a group in one of the biggest rooms in the cave. So coming into the cave, I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how big it was going to be. I didn't know if we were going to have to crawl in this tight spaces. And I feel like just even in the short amount that we've come into the cave, one, it's super obvious to me that somebody would be able to live for an extended amount of time here. I mean, I think weeks is possible, if not longer, if you were prepared. But just even somebody like me who has no experience caving or being prepared for something like this, there's water down here, there's air, it's cool. Even if it was 100 degrees outside, it would still be cool in here. So I think it's really probable somebody could be in here and then you put in that Fisher was a survivalist and he knew the area well. I mean, I, yeah, I think it's very probable he could have been in here for some amount of time. One large factor is part of this cave wasn't mapped when Robert Fisher disappeared. 
and Ray found part of that while we were inside. This passage isn't small, and it was not on their map. And it's really quite simple to dash down in here. We do this then. I'm going to get all the way down there. I'm going to come back in, Brianna. Okay. You're going to climb right over me. Sometimes getting the shots isn't so glamorous. Anything for the shot. (laughs) mud. (laughs) Hang on. We have to get the Oh, this is a cool shot, though. Somehow on the way out, getting our last shots, Sergio and I accidentally got off the mapped path. I don't know about getting out this way. No. Again, that way it goes, it goes down a little. Thanks for guiding us, Jaren. This is probably the tightest part yet. What about, okay. Wait, am I okay? Hold on, hold on. Yep, we're good. Okay. All of the batteries in the GoPros and headlamps and lights were starting to die. We were almost out. Sergio was the last one to climb up. Whoa. Yeah, just be careful right there. Why don't you find your head an inch above it? And then can you guys shut your light? Your head is lights. Am I okay to come out then? No. Right there. Grab my hand. TJ was waiting for us outside. Well, is he in there? Not that we could find. That was cool though. It's safe to say Robert Fisher is not inside that cave alive right now. Could his remains be in there? Possibly, but none have ever been found from the initial search party or from any of the spelunkers who have searched much farther in than we went. Could he have been inside that cave at one point in time? That part is still possible. While all of these local tips were credible, all of a sudden everything was questioned when White Rock Canada became a huge part of the investigation. In 2004, we got a tip from uh, Vancouver area. There was someone in custody and local authorities thought this person is Robert Fisher. What they did is they took photographs, they interviewed him, um, and based on his appearance and, lo- and just looking at him, he had several of the uh, matching features. Robert had back surgery, so he had a a lower back surgical scar. Um, He was missing his left upper bicuspid tooth. He had a gold tooth in its place. This person had both of these features, and he physically resembled Robert Fisher, height and weight and appearance. So that was by far the, uh, the most promising tip that we received. How did you first get involved in this case? I received a phone call from the Canadian police uh, who put me in touch with the person who ultimately became my client. He was in police custody. Explain the, the role the neighbor played in this part of the investigation. He decided to um, insert himself in an investigation and see if he could help. And so he literally went to the police department, met with the officers, they put him in a room, um, they, they pretended that he was one of the inmates being brought in and had him in a room as they brought this person out. According to him, he says, we exchanged eye contact and that he guarantees us that person is Robert Fisher. Is it normal to bring a neighbor into an investigation like that? Uh, that is highly uh, unusual. I've talked to that neighbor on the phone and over text. He doesn't want to do an interview because this was all pretty traumatizing for him, but he told me he is absolutely still sure that was Robert Fisher after years of living next door to him. We all wanted it to be him, and so when that sort of jades our our, uh, opinion of things or or the way we critically look at something, if I want that to be the case, my mind will tell me it's going to be the case. We were able to um, compare this person's fingerprints to Robert's, and unfortunately, they're just not a match. So those prints in Canada matched the actual identity of somebody else? Yes. The person that was detained in Canada never said he was Robert Fisher. He professed his identity, and the fingerprints that he has matched that person's identity. I wanted to interview the Royal Canadian Mounted Police about this, so I reached out. I mean, the way this tip unfolded was so non-traditional. I got a response back from their media relations unit saying to contact the White Rock unit directly. The end of that email said, after this many years, it's unlikely the investigator is still there, but hopefully they can point you in the right direction. 
Then I received another email from a different person that said, unfortunately, we are unable to find anyone who was involved in this incident from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as the records have since been purged. Why were the records purged? That seemed odd. That sergeant then said it wasn't the White Rock unit who dealt with this case, even though their media relations team said they were. So basically, there's no record of any of this happening within the Canadian police. There are definitely still people who think your client is Robert Fisher. What do you want to say to those people? Those people are wrong. That's the end of the story. But that wasn't the end of the story. In that city that's just south of Payson, just before you get to Payson, it's with all the motor bicycles on the right-hand side. Right. Right. When I was sitting with Herb Greenbeck, I knew I was going to learn about ulterior motives Robert may have had on that camping trip. I knew what he was doing. Now I look back at it. I was a perfect person to go with him up there because I knew nothing. But what I didn't know was Herb was about to bring up a theory about what Robert did and where he went after he left that forerunner in the woods. And he brought up a town I had never even heard of before, Rye, Arizona. When we were eating breakfast, he was talking to some guy, and the guy said, yeah, he works um, in that city that's just south of Payson. Just before you get to Payson, it's with all the motor bicycles on the right-hand side. Right. Right. This is what this guy did, and I would never forget this. He says, well, I work in Rye. He goes, well, what do you do? He goes, well, I lay tile. He says, I got a motorcycle. I can ride through the mountains. I can get to Rye in two hours. I work, and then I ride back. He says, well, you pass any houses? He goes, no, it's just like hunting, he said. It was just out in the nature. Well, then when we took off on our ride, we would see people out watering their grass. And he'd always stop and want to talk to them. And he'd say, well, you know, how long have you lived here? What's going on? Do you got much activity up here? It was just very strange. He stashed the motorcycle up there. He left his dog, couldn't take him on the motorcycle. Well, you think he had a motorcycle? Yeah, I think, he sta I think that's what he did. He, he stashed a motorcycle up there. And when he went up there with the dog and him, he loved his dog, Blue. He, that dog, he said goodbye, he jumped on that bike, he drove over to Rye. He met somebody, they took off, and that's his adventure started. He was, he was gone in, in four hours. This is the first time I've ever heard the motorcycle theory. Yes. So where do you think he got the motorcycle from then? I think he picked it up somewhere, I don't know. So at some point you think he had a motorcycle up there? in preparation for this. Because of the entire weekend we were together, he was most interested in how long it took this guy to get on his bike and get to ride. And what did he see when he went to ride? Was he going through fire rows, homes, neighborhoods? And the guy said, it's like camping, it's desolate. It's just a, only a motorcycle to get down this road. And he seemed fixated on that. Totally fixated on that. Okay, so we know Herb's story involved the town of Rye, bikers, and some sort of bar. So we are literally on the search for any bar in Rye, and we came across Jake's Corner Bar. We don't know if this is the one he's talking about, but we're gonna go in and see what we can find out. We're looking for a bar in Rye, or a Rye bar. Are we in the right spot? Uh, yeah, you're just south. The other bar got torn down last year, actually. How long was it there for, um, do you know? I, it was probably there since, what, the 60s? Are there a lot of bikers here? There are a lot of bikers. A lot of bike traffic through Jake's Corner here, and then Rye used to get a lot of bike traffic back in the day. As far as bikers go, that the story we had heard was that, you know, the weekend before, Robert and his friend had met some biker who had talked about the Rye Bar and talked about being able to bike on a road that no one would see. Does any of that ring a bell to you? You know, on the highway and that, the 188, <laughs> or any of these highways through here would probably be you know, good spots. There's old back roads out the back side of Rye that go all the way to Young and, you know, through the 76 Ranch and all through them areas. Is it on a map? Not really. A lot of the trails out here aren't on maps. Yeah, there used to be an old motorcycle kind of yard up in Rye right next to the bar, actually. Okay, that's good to know. Not there anymore either? No, they had a big fire there, you're, you know, probably 10 years back, and then it kind of got all salvaged out. What was it called? All bikes. So it's feasible that Robert could have had a motorcycle or a bike and put it up near where his car was and taken it on a road that nobody would have seen? Yeah, I guess it's probable, yeah. 
I feel like Herb's theory is possible. There's no way for us to confirm that, but based on everything we learned about Robert asking those questions and the bar and bike shop that used to be there, it absolutely makes that possible. The problem with all of this is there's no concrete evidence anybody saw Robert in the woods or in Young or in Rye. Not one sighting was confirmed to 100% be him. For tangible evidence, we have the house, we have the ATM, we have the forerunner. And that's, and that's it. it. It's tough to make a puzzle with three pieces. I think if this same case happened um, today, uh, we would have more, there are more uh, resources that we can put into place. So not just his cell phone, but more people with cell phones. I think it would be a little bit more difficult uh, with more video cameras, with more things we would do a more um, thorough neighborhood canvas and so especially with doorbell cameras and things now um, we're finding more success with that we have a we have a black and white video from an ATM from 20 years ago and now I think we would have traffic cameras I think we would have um, again surveillance video from all different angles and different places we wanted to see for ourselves, so we walked the neighborhood now. Another ring right there. Like, is that a camera or is it not a camera? I think it is a camera. In 2022. Another ring right there. That was one. You counted six, took pictures of six. I counted six cameras, yeah. It's a combination of security cameras and ring, ring doorbells. doorbells. Um, and I counted eight or nine. We had a couple overlap, but we're looking at 15 cameras on the way here, eight alone on this intersection, so. 23 times that Robert Fisher could have been caught on camera yeah. just from his house to the ATM. So we thought we had gone through and investigated all the tips we knew of. And we wrapped up recording this podcast with a former homicide detective on a completely different and unrelated case. And we casually mentioned to him as we were wrapping up, we were in the middle of the Robert Fisher investigation. Well, that's when he says to Sergio and me, oh, I have this tip you have to investigate that nobody's looked into before, a credible crime that may have involved Robert Fisher right after he disappeared. And we're like, what? So back in April, Sergio and I were recording a podcast on how detectives get suspects to confess to crime, the tactics, strategies, things like that. And we interviewed a retired homicide detective who has about 30 years of experience. We had finished recording, we were wrapping up, we shut down all of our equipment, and we just casually mentioned to him we are in the middle of this Robert Fisher investigation. And he goes, oh my gosh, I have information that nobody's ever followed up on. He owned a house up in Sholo and remembered a home near his, a little blue house on the corner the owner was assaulted by somebody coming out of a wooded area asking for money this was so unexpected I wanted to vet this out I figured if there was an assault it had to be on record with either a police or a sheriff's department I had my assignment editor Sean Thompson look up that address on LexisNexis and it showed a previous owner by the name of Gene Wild who died in 2014 I texted the detective to ask if that name rang a bell, and he said, yes, Gene is correct. Okay, we were getting somewhere. Navajo County Sheriff's Office sent me the report. This is what the report said. Gene stated that while he was in his studio, he noticed a man walking across his property from the west. The man stated that he wanted some money. Gene told the man that he would hire him to do yard work. The man replied by telling Gene to off. The man pushed Gene and then punched him in the head. Gene stated that he had never seen the man before. Gene described the man as being tall but slender. The suspect was not located at that time. And then I found the one glaringly obvious problem. The date of the assault is August 14th, 2000. That's eight months before the Fisher family murders and home explosion. The detective's memory of this event was spot on. He was just a little bit off on his timeline. If anything though, I could credibly rule this tip out for good, knowing I tracked it down to the source and vetted it out. Do you feel you've gotten the answer as to why he did this? No, no, not yet. I can guess, I can give you my opinion. Well, he didn't want his kids to grow up living the life that he did with, because he his parents separated. So that's always, been given to us from interviews as to why he would have done this. The only reason to kill the kids is so they didn't have to go on in life with a divorced family. 
That seems to be the only possible theory that anybody can settle on is that he did not want them in We're some done. sort of separated- I created you, I take you away. Halfway through our podcast series about this investigation, one of Robert Fisher's sisters, Jean, reached out to me and we talked on the phone for an hour and a half. While she didn't want her face or voice on camera, she did give me permission to relay some thoughts she has about our investigation. She said out of the three siblings, herself, her sister, and Robert, Robert did take their parents' divorce the hardest and she could imagine him saying divorce would not be on the table for his own family. However, she still couldn't imagine him choosing murder over divorce, at least not the Robert she knew. Those Mexico lookalike pictures, she at first thought that was legitimately her brother, but authorities have ruled out that tip after they found the man. TJ had said in his interviews with friends and co-workers of Robert Fisher, none of them said anything about him ever going caving or splunking. But Gene said he actually used to do that quite a bit before he joined the military. So now we know he actually did have experience inside caves. At this point, Jean hopes Robert is dead. She says if he is found alive, there's no doubt he committed this horrible crime. And if he is alive, she fears her family could be in danger. But she says if he's dead, she still believes there's a chance somebody else was targeting him and their family, and he may have been killed. Her family has chosen to forgive Robert. They say living with the burden of anger is just too hard. They do think if he did this, that he snapped and had a mental breakdown and that it wasn't premeditated. He knew what he was gonna do. You think it was premeditated? Oh, yes, absolutely, 100%. It was too good. Look how many people do this and they can't get away with it. Is Robert Fisher dead or alive? And where in the world is he? I honestly, I would not be wasting my time if I had evidence or if we had indication that he's deceased. You don't think there's any chance he's dead? Not right now, no, not at all. Even with all the new information and details we've learned, there are so many strange things that set this case apart from every other. But I have never seen so many people disagree about something, and maybe that's exactly what Robert Fisher wanted. He's integrated himself into somewhere that he can not put off those red flags. He's got a new life, new family. You think he has a new family? Potentially, yeah, yeah. Either he went up um, to young and took his own life or some tragedy befell him. I lean towards the fact that I don't think he's alive today. If you believe he is dead, where do you think his body is? If he went up there with the intent of, um, I'm just gonna, gonna camp for a while, and now that he realizes the police are here, he could easily have walked five miles in one direction and, and then either committed suicide or again something happened. We, we would have never been able to find him, especially if he went out onto the reservation because that's, that is a sovereign nation that we don't have rights to just, to just walk through, especially with, with weapons. My belief was he walked out, especially after I talked to that couple that was driving on the young road. So let's say he is alive. Do you think he will ever be found or identified if he's alive? If he, if he makes a mistake. What if he doesn't? I, I don't know, Brianna. I can't, there's no guarantees. I think he's alive. I think he's living his life. In Arizona? Maybe. You never do know who your neighbors are.